Uh, oh no, it's behind the. Okay, wait. Yeah. I can do. I can do this. Oh. Oh, that's fun. All right. I didn't know if I was supposed to click on it, but I guess. Uh, I guess there's layers of this. Uh, All right. All right. So I think we can get started. So it's good for gathering. So yeah, today it's a pleasure to have Jared Goldberg from Flatirons who is going to talk about um, also star envelopes and their dynamic uh, features. So please start. Yeah. Like I say, dynamic lives and explosive gaps. Um, yeah. So yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm excited to talk to all of you about some of the work that we've been doing on. Uh, modeling convection in massive stars, and particularly evolved massive stars with big radii and uh, and and even bigger convective uh, bubbles. And so, just to to set the stage a little bit, I think it's always useful to kind of go back to the basics of just massive star life cycle. I don't know if there's uh, galaxies, people, and 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 supernova people, and you know, not. Well, do astrophysics, but you know, the star starts as a cloud of gas. It contracts, eventually starts using hydrogen on the main sequence, lives for a while, runs out of hydrogen in the core. If it's massive enough, it starts using helium into carbon, carbon into oxygen, etc. Around that time, it inflates into a giant, right? This, or even supergiant, the radius goes out to kind of the orbit of Jupiter, even. Uh, keeps fusing in its core up to iron at some point. The iron core collapses, releases energy into the star, explodes it as a type two supernova, leaves behind black holes or neutron stars as these compact remnants, recycles all that material back into the interstellar medium and into the galaxies around it, and the cycle keeps going, right? And I'm really particularly interested in what we can learn from observations of type two supernovae by understanding the structure of the stars that die, understanding what the supergiant stars, you know, uh, what 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 they impart on that explosion and and on that, um, you know, on the and how they affect these our interpretations of these observations. So, what does a core collapse supernova look like? Well, the most common type is called a type two p or type two plateau supernova. Type two, because there's hydrogen. This is just a sort of spectroscopic classification. They see hydrogen, they say it's type two. Right? Type P, the plateau, is set by recombination of that hydrogen. As the ejecta expands, it gets cool. Hydrogen recombines and kind of sets a photosphere that causes this plateau. The plateau is why it's type two P, or plateau. And then at late times, there's this tail powered by the decay of nickel 56 to cobalt 56 to iron 56 and so on. And these are observations they've been observed and there's diversity in these events. There's diversity in both how long they last, how bright they are, and a lot of my interests are in kind of understanding what sets that diversity. We also know that these red supergiant or that these type 2p and type 2 supernovae in general come from the explosions of very bright, very cool stars. So red supergiants. Here's an HR diagram. These are some stellar evolution tracks. These are all stars that have then been observed to explode, or really stars where we saw the explosion, then dug through HST archival data, and then found the star that died and said, ah, it is here on the HR diagram. And I'm going to be talking mostly about these black points and these green points, type 2 supernovae and type 1b, or 2b supernovae coming from red and yellow supergiant stars. So first I'm going to talk mostly about red supergiants and then I'll switch gears a little bit. Right in the question, how do we understand diversity in the observations of supernovae has an answer which is maybe hopefully a little obvious, which is well, there's diversity in the stars, there's diversity in the stellar structure, the energies of the explosions and the environments surrounding the star. And because I know that uh, you know, a lot uh, there's a lot of theory work going into galaxy simulations and formation in at least in this building. Um, I want to point out that this is actually a really important thing to get right, the under or at least important thing to constrain. Understanding the 
supernovae provide feedback in galaxy formation and in, uh, you know, in, you know, they heat the interstellar material, the interstellar medium, and for different explosion energies, you can blow different size bubbles in your galaxies. And finally, dwarf galaxy simulations are even getting down to the scale where we're in single star precision. So this is a, a paper that Uli Steinwandel and I wrote, where Uli basically is resolving star formation and feedback down to the sort of four solar mass star particle. So we can really say this star will explode, this one won't. And we're leaving the era of every star that could explode will explode with 10 to the 51 Ergs, and going into the regime of, well, some of them will not explode. Some of them will explode with a little bit. And so being able to make statements about those populations of explosions from supernova observations is becoming more important than ever, especially when we're trying to make more of these first principles uh, calculations. Right? So you can see here in this, you know, here's one where the all, all of them exploded with 10 to the 52 Ergs. Right? They have these huge bubbles. The feedback is quenched correspondingly. Here we exploded all of them with 10 to the 50 Ergs. You have all of these sort of small scale levels, and actually, you almost you get almost no hot phase of the ISM, which is interesting. There's all sorts of interesting things to you know to happen depending on you know. And then here we have more realistic models of some of them explode with different energies. Um, anyway, so right, the big question is then: we see a supernova. How do we you know? We do space forensics. How do we know? We see something die. How do we know what died? How do we know what killed it? How do we know? How, you know, how much energy there was, what was the ejected mass, right? And it's important to point out that it's the properties of the core of the star, deep in the star, that determine the energy of the explosion and the compact remnant. But it's the properties of the envelope of the star that really mediate and determine what you see, both when the star is alive and especially when the star explodes. Right, so the schematic we have is the iron core collapses, that's half a second. A shock takes a day to travel through this envelope that goes out to the orbit of Jupiter. It keeps expanding, eventually it cools near the surface, you start to see deeper and deeper and deeper in, and then eventually it goes nebular. Which means that the emission is then determined basically by where is the photosphere and what was the stellar structure there. So at the very early times, you see the outer layers, right? You go from outside in, you see the hot outer layers, the shock runs through it, breaks out of that material. A little while later on that plateau, it's the hydrogen rich envelope, the interior that sets that plateau emission. And then at late times, the core structure and the explosion geometry and the nickel yield are what determine that late time emission. And so another thing that we could, you know, that, that, that we want to be able to do is say, well, we see, you know, we want to constrain nickel nucleosynthesis, for example. If we measure the nickel tail, we want to be able to say, well, what was the explosion energy? That's another you know, direction that this is important from. Right, so how do these explosion properties really map onto the light curves? We can even just start thinking about this a little bit analytically or tilde physics analytically, right? The luminosity, how bright this is, is just an energy divided by a time scale. We can do dimensional analysis. We say that the energy, now we'll just say one zone, all the energy is in this expanding ball, right? So this is the volume of that sphere-ish times the energy density. And the diffusion time is just how long it takes photons to escape that expanding ball, which is you know, the number of times a photon will scatter times the mean free path divided by the speed of light, you can cast that in terms of the mass over the density or, you know, or I should say the density over the, you know, over, over the cross section or something like that. And you can work this out and then you get basically that the luminosity goes something like the explosion energy times the radius divided by the mass. Meaning that the more energetic the explosion, the brighter, the bigger the radius, the brighter. The more mass you have, actually the fainter, because you've distributed that explosion energy among more stuff. You can do a similar calculation to get basically how long does it last. You can say something like, when does the diffusion time equal the, the expansion time, the time it had, the sort of you know, r over its expansion velocity or something like that. And that gets you, in the end, sort of two equations for the energy, the mass, and the radius. And you can do this more carefully. You can fit it to suites of numerical models. You can, this is, you know, 
very crude one zone expanding sphere, but you can do it in more detail. But ultimately, you really will get two equations with three unknowns. Well, what can you do with two equations, three unknowns? Mass, energy, radius, right? Well, you can measure how bright it is, how long it lasts. You see a supernova, you measure how bright it is, how long it lasts. You measure how much nickel was produced because that can be a correction to how long it lasts because you're adding extra energy from the nickel decay. And then you can invert some semi-analytic scaling laws, either ones that we, you know, we did this with ones we calibrated from our numerical simulations, uh, you know, sort of exploding spheres. You can do this in an analytic way. But the basic idea is that you get a degeneracy, but a useful one, which is that for the same light curve with the same brightness and duration, you have sort of a relationship between as a function of the radius, what ejecta masses with what explosion energies can get you a light curve like that. So a bright, so, so for a given brightness and duration, the more mass you have, you need more explosion energy and a smaller radius to get the same light curve as a smaller ejecta mass with a bigger radius and lower explosion energy. Now, this cloud of points here are a bunch of MESA models, 1D stellar evolution models, assume your stars or spheres, where I just changed uncertainties in, in the stellar evolution input physics with really reasonable values. And you can cover this entire sort of parameter space, right? Meaning that 1D stellar evolution does not constrain if you let it not constrain, or you know, if you if you allow it even reasonable uncertainties, it does not constrain your ejecta mass versus radius relation. So there are a lot of people who are blowing up stars and using grids. And one, one thing to warn about is that when you pick a grid of stellar evolution models and you're trying to reproduce light curves, if you pick your grid that's you know sort of very narrow in this in the actual parameter space controlling the light curves, you will find a solution. So these are four models of the sort of six models on one commonly used grid that come from the Kepler set. And they will, they will find a solution consistent with the light curve, but there's not a guarantee that that's the right solution where it could be, you know, more massive, more compact. Right, and this is something to worry about. Actually, the power of this grid that I'm showing is not in its, you know, for those of you that know Takashi Mori's 2023, uh, to 200,000 light curve grid. The power of that grid is actually not in its progenitor sampling, but in its uh, circumstellar material properties. So you know, if, you, if you want to know how to use that grid well and what it's good for, I have lots of thoughts and we can talk about that too, right? So, and we can, we can verify this, right? We can take models at different radii, explode them with different, you know, with the prescribed energies and they all get great matches to the light curve. Right. You know, maybe chi squared will tell you that one of these is better, but I don't think that you can. And the other thing to know is that people have tried to close this system of equations with a plateau velocity, but because the plateau velocity is a standard candle with the luminosity, it doesn't actually close the system of equations. You don't actually get that closure, right? If you match it on the plateau, the, the luminosity, you get the velocity. It's why some people are trying to use type 2Ps as a standard candle because of the luminosity and velocity. But if you have a progenitor radius measurement, which we did for this case was 2017 EAW, then you actually can constrain the explosion energy and the ejecta mass. And if not, you sort of get these bands of what's, pos you know, what's plausible, which is still useful. The other thing to notice is that at very early times, the velocities are just probing the outermost stuff. And so at the very early times, actually, you do have another lever where you might be able to close this system to equations three unknowns. Well, now we might be able to get a third constraint. The problem is it's really hard to measure the velocity in the early times. And as I'll mention, you know, we need to think a little bit about where that emission is coming from as well. And another piece of the puzzle is that when we look at observations, oftentimes there's an early excess in the data, in the luminosity data compared to what the models say there should be. Right, so what do we make of the early time emission? Well, the first 20 days of the supernova come from shock cooling 
of really the outermost 0.01 to 0.1 solar masses of the star. It's really this outer fluff, right? So at day, you know, at, at day 10, right, it's 0.01 solar masses. This envelope is like 10 solar masses, so that is a very small fraction of the envelope, really the outermost fluff, right? And what does the star look like in that regime? Well, again, while we're still playing the game of assuming stars are spheres, you can make uh, you can make different assumptions about how you treat your outer boundary of the of your 1D simulation. If you use Kepler versus Mesa, which are two stellar evolution codes, you get these sort of different structures. And your outer density profile can vary, and the slope of that profile varies depending on your physical assumptions. And even when you're doing semi-analytic surfaces, you often will assume something like pure radiation transport dominates and that gives you a profile or purely efficient convection, maximally efficient convection gives you a different density profile, right? And reality might still be somewhere in between. And then even then you still often need circumstellar material to interpret these early light curves, which also still assumes a density profile or it can calculate a density profile as, as some people in this room are trying to do or doing, I should say. Um, and this then, impacts the early light curves. So when you explode the Kepler models versus the Mesa models, you get sort of morphologically different early light curves because of this event, which you know can be understood, uh, but you know we want to. And, and these are you know, spherical cows, right? So it's it's useful to ask, well what what do we expect the surfaces of these stars to look like when we think about them in a more 3D of a way? And just to say it out loud, the envelopes of red supergiant stars and of these stars that these explosions happen in are fully convective. So, you know, you have, you know, from near the core all the way out to the orbit of Jupiter, say, you know, that's where the surface of the star is. You have convection going. And this convection, the just mixing length theory, which is a 1D theory of convection, argues and says that sort of how, how, long, how, how, how long is your plume coherent? Well, it's roughly proportional to the pressure scale height, right? So the size of your bubble is some number alpha, which is like one to three or 10 or something, probably three, times the pressure scale height at, you know, at a given location, times one E folding in pressure there, right? So how, how, how long is the pressure dropping off? So in the sun, we have, we see at the surface of the sun, we see this you know, beautiful large scale convection, right? Each one of these plumes, this is actual data from the Daniel K. Inouye Solar Telescope. Each one of these plumes is the size of the United States state of Texas, right? That's huge. But H over R, the pressure scale height divided by the radius of the star is actually a pretty small number at the surface of the star. It's a thin layer. And so the, the bubbles are correspondingly small Right? And so you have a million of these things tiled across the surface of the sun, and really the sun is more or less a spherical cow. Right? In red supergiants, and now these are simulations that were done in the, I guess, late, 2000, late 2000s, early 2010s by Andrea Chiavasa and others, and Bern Freitag, right? we have H over R is much larger. And the size of your convection is expected to be something like an AU in scale. One AU is 215 solar radii. It's the only number I know in AU. Um, right? And so, you know, while the sun is approximately spherical, this is, I'm still showing a cartoon because it's a simulation, but the cow has ears and horns and other interesting features. Right? And when you're saying H, which H is it? H, so I mean the pressure scale height. Well, here, actually, I'll show Yeah, so, so here's actually the plot, which is, um, so these now are MESA models. These are 1D, assume the star is a sphere, but I've changed the mixing length alpha. So I've changed how many scale heights you assume convection is coherent over, basically. So Ren, to get to, your, to answer your question, H over R is this middle panel locally. I'm sort of saying kind of near the mid radial coordinate or something like that, something characteristic. Because it's true that the pressure scale height drops as you get closer and closer to the surface. But if the motions are coherent down here over long length scales, you have this fluid motion that is you know, still coherent, and the mixing length condition is a condition on acceleration rather than velocity. So you still have some stuff that is flowing. Right. 
So you expect kind of the coherence length to be something like an average-ish of the envelope HF of, you know, of the envelope pressure scale that more or less. Right, so as it turns out, what you assume about that alpha really affect the radius. So one of the ways that I was able to get so much diversity in my stars was by changing the mixing length from kind of one to four. And those are all people, people are using one, people are using four, and it's, you can get a huge variation. You know, the best thing to do is kind of to calibrate to numerical simulations or observations, that ends up getting a number that's more like three. Right, the other thing is that the pressure scale height is a significant fraction of the radius. And even as you go farther and farther out, it can still be, you know, one to ten percent of the of the stellar radius, even towards the you know, very outer layers. And radiation and gas pressure are both important to the pressure support. All right, so you have this turbulent medium where photons are also even just contributing to its hydrostatic support. And the envelope is very massive and loosely bound. So to explore this further, one is we wanted to just study the properties of convection. I'm not going to talk so much about that. In these, in, in some, uh, we made some 3D simulations of red supergiants. This is with Athena++, we collaborated on Fei Zhang and also Lars Bilson at KITP. And we see these really large scale coherent flows going from basically the surface all the way down into where our inner boundary is. Um, you know, the steady state envelopes have these kind of transonic convective velocity. So near the surface, it's, you know, the flow is moving at or near the sound speed, and they're coherent for a few hundred days. So in the second that the core takes to collapse and the one day that the shock wave will travel through the star, any one of these times is kind of frozen in, right? It's sonic and the, uh, the shock will be very supersonic. So a hierarchy of time scales, you shouldn't be that surprised by that. So the inner boundary is not at the core. The inner boundary is not at the core, no. It's uh, computationally incredibly difficult to, to move the inner boundary in much further. The deeper you put your inner boundary, the, the shorter and shorter time steps you need to take in order to resolve it. Yeah, so that is, that is one sort of limitation. Our inner boundary is kind of in the middle of the envelope, or you know, at a few hundred solar radii. The envelope is in the thousands. So what fraction of that of the radius of the star? Uh, this is about, so for this simulation I'm showing, it's about a third. Yeah, the other one, it's about half. Is that in distance or mass? In distance. It's most, um, it's in distance. So the mass outside here is not negligible. There's maybe a few solar masses outside here and 10-ish solar masses inside here. Yeah. And actually, one of the, just a fun little aside is that in order, the first time we tried it, we didn't include the, the, the spherical gravity of the envelope mass above that core. And then we started eating mass through our inner boundary, and all of a sudden we started with a you know, normal red supergiant, and it became a 50 solar mass, 4,000 solar radius thing, because the envelope just wanted to blast off into space and pull stuff in through its inner boundary. So the envelope mass is important in its self-gravity. It's very loosely bound otherwise. Oh, because you took a mass module that does include the gravity and then you put the exactly. of the gravity. Yep. Well, so it's... All of this is a bit of stellar engineering in that when you take the, the MESA model, you really use that to sort of flavor the inner boundary, and then you wait for this to run until it reaches some kind of convective steady state. Do your best to see, you know, make sure that at least the region you want to analyze is in a steady state and, and go from there. Yeah. Also a simple question. What yes. is the pressure scale height of this model? So the minutes. Hmm. Uh, what is H over R in this model? It's, I would say it's, it's comparable to the, um, it's comparable to what we see in, in the NASA models, comparable kind of to the green one, more or less. Um, but in, 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 in stellar radii, the pressure scale height is, I mean, you know, as Ren points out, it's a depth dependent quantity, but it's something like, you know, something like a, uh, something like a few hundred solar radii or a couple hundred solar radii. Yeah. Right. And so actually, another interesting result of this kind of flow is the large scale convective flows can carry significant randomly oriented angular momentum. So actually, in the case that so this is work also um, by Elliot Quadrant, Andrea Antoni, others that 
sort of has quantified this, we've quantified this in our models as well, but the punchline is basically in the event that this big envelope does try to directly collapse into a black hole, the supernova mechanism does not succeed in exploding, you have these really large scale flows with random angular momentum that the net of that angular momentum in the envelope may be zero, but as they accrete onto the central object, that can cause basically a sort of, uh, you know, angular momentum driven transient, almost like a jittering jets type of thing that will uh, be this sort of accretion power transient that can look sort of like a luminous supernova or, or some other thing. Um, and there's other observational implications or tests of the large scale convection in this you know, stellar convection. So one of them uh, is that if you have a few plumes and you can constrain the photocenter of your star to better than the radius of the star, which sounds crazy, but actually Gaia can kind of do it, or at least potentially do it. Gaia for you know, a lot of these stars has their photocenter constrained even better than the radius of their star. Then you would actually see a sort of jitter in this photocenter corresponding to these convective motions. And this is argued as to whether or not Gaia itself can do it, might be dominated by Gaia systematics. Chris Kachanik has a paper on that. But even just conceptually, this is a really interesting uh, outcome. Another outcome is that actually you might even mistake sort of some upwellings, large scale upwellings and large scale downwellings for what look like a dipole rotational velocity. Uh, and so at current ALMA resolution, if you took a non-rotating simulation of the star Betelgeuse or something kind of like Betelgeuse, you would see, well, here this stuff looks like it's moving outwards, this stuff looks like it's moving inwards, you squint, you get that, and then, you know, this looks like a dipole. So you would say, well, it must be rotating really fast. And that's actually one of the reasons some people think Betelgeuse was a merger, they, or, you know, something like that. It's hard to do because Betelgeuse is also a runaway star, and we see it has a bow shock, so that would suggest it was probably an accretor. But you know, its, it's companion eventually disappeared and died and ran away. But some of that, a lot of the argument for that is actually that at the surface it looks like it's rotating far too fast to just be a normal supertrain. But it's possible that some of those uh, inferences are actually just contaminated by this large-scale convection. And one way to get to do better is to you know, if you can resolve something that looks more like that with better ALMA, you know, better resolution in next generation ALMA like detectors or something, you actually can start to place better constraints. The current outlet could just wait a bit and see if the orientation changes. Exactly. Yeah. So that was what I think one thing they proposed to do in this paper too, is you wait a bit and you see if the orientation changes. It's there's some evidence that it's interesting if you go back and read sort of ALMA papers on like you know, is Betelgeuse rotating or these kinds of things, they do get different orientations, but they always say, oh, well, the last data was really, we don't believe it, which I think is kind of an interesting <laughs> uh, historical thing. And, and sometimes it's like they did find legitimate problems with the, with the last paper that came out. So, you know, that's, there's some evidence, but it's, it's also true. Yeah, we can just wait, take a bunch of ALMA observations and eventually, you know, as long as we take them far enough apart that it should be here, we really should not see a persistent dipole because that would be strong evidence for you know, rotation. And the other thing is that you do get some of this just manifest itself in stochastic variability on a time scale of the convective overturn time. So these are just light curves from our simulations and you can see sort of these modulations that this one's purely stochastic, this one maybe has some quasi-periodic behavior under it, but there is this stochastic component. Cool. So, I like supernovae. What matters for the supernova? Well, the fluctuations are largest toward, you know, the farther out you get in the star. And so we want to say, you know, well, one place we can look is just the outer outermost stuff. And to look at, therefore, the earliest, earliest times in the supernova, the shock breakout. Right. So the intrinsic rise of the supernova occurs over, you know, basically occurs the shocks traveling out through the star. Photons are, you know, sort of trapped behind that shock. That shock's moving very fast. It's very optically thick ahead of the shock. Photon wants to escape. The shock's moving at the shock velocity. The photon is trying to diffuse at the speed of light divided by the optical depth tau, which gives you a condition that once the optical depth of the shock reaches the speed of light divided by the shock velocity, photons can escape. It'll start to get bright. This happens on, so here's my little schematic. Right, you have the photon bouncing around. There's the shock front eventually escapes ahead of it. 
And for shock velocities of a few thousand kilometers per second, this is sort of optical depths of about 100. So it's deep in the star, but, well, you know, or deep by someone's standards, right? It's not at the photosphere. It's actually even outside the traditional photosphere as you start to ionize some of the stuff depending on the, on the star, but that's maybe just a detail. The point is that this happens on the diffusion time of that outer layer, which is the thickness of your tau, you know, tau of 100 outwards surface divided by the speed of light times tau, which you can cast in terms of the density and the shock velocity. Right? This is about tens of minutes for a typical 1D stellar model. Now, the radii of these stars are really large. And so if that time scale is small compared to the light crossing time of that star, this is really interesting because if the diffusion time is small and the radius is large, it actually smears the shock breakout by the light travel time r over c, which is about 30 minutes for an 800 solar radius red supergiant. Right? And that would be great because then if we can measure this shock breakout and get that duration, get that width, that gets us r over c, which you, know, you can multiply by c, you get the radius of the star, that just goes back and directly lets us constrain the degeneracies we had earlier, right? We can say, well, we know the star was 900 solar radii. We know the star was 400 solar radii. Therefore, the energy is this, the mass is this, once you see the whole light curve. So that would be nice, right? Unfortunately, the 3D surface is not quite so friendly. So there's two things that happen. One is there's just more fluff in the 3D simulations. There is material at lower densities than 10 to the negative 9. Some of this can be even predicted or approximated in 1D and in 1D theory, and this entails shock breakout at a lower density. So this lengthens the diffusion time already to more than an hour, which is already greater than R over C. But still, we have, you know, at least an understanding of how that diffusion time scales with the density, the shock velocity, other things. The other thing is a more fundamentally 3D effect, which is that the large scale plumes entail sort of a variety of what this tau of 100 surface will be. And this gives us kind of introduces a new length scale. It's sort of a delta R, if you will, of 100. And it's kind of the valley to mountain depth. It's your topographic ascent as you are, you know, as you the shock front travel. So the shock, as it travels from the center outwards, assume it's roughly spherical, it's going to hit the valleys before it hits the hillsides, B, before it hits the plateau, before it hits the peaks of the mountains of these conductive and so when we run a strong shock through our 3D uh, red supergiant simulations, that's basically exactly what we see, is it hits, you know, kind of here, breaks out, you know, expands, right, it corrugates in the inhomogeneous layers, the asymmetries lead to a 100 solar radius spread in the shock breakout location. I'm aware that it looks like an exploding Pokeball. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's, yeah, so, so you can kind of see that. Here. Here's another visualization that was done by the professional team at NASA, mostly working with Young Fei. Um, actually, kind of like, I think the other one does a different job visualizing it, but you sort of see this is our maximally asymmetric model. So really, there's one big valley that it, that it hits first. It gets bright. So this is the uh, radiation energy density. Here's the pressure. Here's the velocities. And here's the, the density. But you kind of see this structure as it, as it goes out. Um, maybe I'll show that one more time. Right, so it sort of breaks out there, it's breaking out here, it starts to break out. These are kind of the valleys. It also, interesting, well, I'll show that in a moment. It also, interestingly, like the stuff in the valleys kind of gets almost umbrella flipping inverted. So that stuff shoots out a little bit faster than the stuff when it hits the mountains. So it gets an interesting, you know, sort of topographical inversion, which I'll mention. Right, so then what does this do, the shock breakout? Well, in a 1D model where you kind of truncate the photosphere at the the photosphere of the star, of the underlying star, well, you get this you know, nice R over C smearing that you can use to tell me this is an 800 solar radius red supergiant. When you take the 1D average of the 3D model, which includes this lower density material, you blow that up, you get the red dashed line, which is kind of somewhere in between the black line, which I'll mention. The time scale here is the diffusion time of that outer layer, which is about 1.2 hours for this particular. Right. However, for the 3D model, this is now, we're going to look here. To the left is the temperature of the fastest moving material. This is kind of like a topography map where if it's dark, it's been cooling a little bit. 
This is now the flux. There might look like a smudge on the screen at kind of near point A. That's not a coincidence. This is basically you put your eyeball to the photosphere. Each of the gray lines here is just a different, not eyeball to the photosphere, right? You, the observer, far away are just squinting at this from different angles, right? And so that's what's kind of approximated by those gray lines is if you're squinting at it from over there or over there or over there, right? You wait 1.2 hours, one diffusion time. Now, B has started to break out, starts to get cooler. You see it get brighter, right? Similarly to this point, not really labeled. Right, time goes on, time goes on, and actually even at the peak in the luminosity, some parts of the star have not yet really experienced the shock breakout. They're still dark, relatively darker, and still relatively hotter because the shock travels. And actually, maybe even I think there's a little wiggle here that kind of corresponds to D getting hit, if you really want to stare at it. Right, so then the duration of the black curve is one of the gray curves. The black curve is the average. Uh, the black curve is uh, just the total luminosity leading the simulation. So the, the, the black curve, the black curve is basically four pi r squared times the flux d, or it's, it's really it's the flux d you know, integral of flux d area leaving the simulation domain. Each black line is four pi r squared times the flux of some observer far away on some simulation, on, you know, somewhere in the simulation domain. So as an observer, I will not see the black curve, but you will see one of the gray curves. As, a, as an observer, I think you'd see one of the gray curves, not the black curve, but the black curve is this sort of best estimate for what a gray curve you probably should see is. Yeah. Right, so here's, you know, we also can do this at different explosion energies and check some scalings. Well, one thing that's interesting is you can also just estimate the peak of the, the bolometric luminosity. You can say, like, how bright should this thing be? We'll go back to our dimensional analysis, energy divided by a time, but instead we'll use how much energy is just in the outer shell of radiation, kind of outside this tau of C over V. Roughly in the time scale then becomes this shot crossing time of the valley to mountain traversal depth. Right, you work this out. And you actually get a different scaling than if you were to assume this was a diffusion time. So the thing that's notable here is that you, it, it scales with roughly the explosion energy, really it's sort of V squared divided by delta R. So you've introduced delta R, this you know, depth into your equations, right? But because this time scale is also longer, you get kind of a smearing of the shock breakout, which also has different scalings with the luminosity and, and, and duration of this shock breakout pulse with the shock velocity explosion energy, and now with this delta R. Which means, unfortunately, we can't very likely, you know, unless, except in, yeah, unless, unless delta R is small relative to the radius of the star, which it does not seem to be, we can't really use R over C to constrain shock breakout because this delta R over V shock will sort of smear this whole thing out or to constrain the radius of the star. But the cool thing is that we've now introduced delta R, which means that these, you know, observations of these things actually have the ability to probe the inhomogeneities of the outer layers. So, you know, you can kind of flip it and be like, well, we can learn new things, even though there's more work to be done sort of disentangling these. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. do you expect a different patches of the star, like mm -hmm. the breakout mission would have different temperatures, like how? how yes. Yeah, that's exactly the, no, that's a, that's a great question. So. One of the predictions then is that when you have, you know, so you're, you're far away, you see shock near the shock breakout peak, you see, you know, some of the stuff that has just undergone shock breakout, some of the stuff that is currently undergoing shock breakout, some will be very hot, some will be cooler, all of that's kind of contributing to the luminosity, you would expect a smearing of the early SED from this. And if we want to convert from uh, you know, these kind of gray calculations, or we, if we want to convert from from these kinds of observables to something that like ultrasat will see or uvex will see or something in an actual telescope and you want to get the SED right. Uh, I think there's there's more work to be done there. So this is very preliminary results. Athena plus plus the code we use can now do uh, multi-group radiation transport. And we do see a bit of a smearing of this SED, but I think that take this very much as you know, a pile of salt at this point. I think the hardest thing there is actually just getting realistic opacities 
getting good multi-group opacities, as many of you are nodding along, is very hard. Um, nothing is really well tested against each other, and then even putting it in a readable format is, is, a, is a bit of a pain. So there's, you know, it, that is to say it's a great question. It's important to be thinking about. Um, and, you know, if people have ways of estimating, you know, analytically what we might even expect, that would be awesome to, to chat. I also want to talk a bit about, okay, I want to talk a bit about also like coupling this stuff to the environment. So one of the cool things that we're starting to see in these, and people are now simulating supernova remnants as well with kind of parameterized and homogeneities and things. And one of the things they're finding is that sort of strong, this large scale like external near surface clumping seems to be needed to explain the sort of spatial power spectrum of supernova remnants. And what I have to add here, this is from uh, Sohan Mandal's 2023 paper with, with Abby Polin and Paul Duffel um, and others, that we see some of this clumping just ab initio in the 3D envelope simulations. And then just the thing to point out, just as a almost point of conversation more than anything, is just when we run the shot through it, it's the stuff in the valley, you know, ends up getting ahead of it, and we get light scale, you know, sort of a, a spatial correlation scale that tracks what the surface was, but it, you know, the topography changes and inverts, and so it's, it's an interesting thing. The other thing is that when this, you know, in this large-scale convection, if you manage to do sort of a pre-supernova outburst scenario, you, you dump a bunch of energy at the base of the envelope, people are using this to explain that early excess, for example, Daichi, uh, if you dump it in the 3D convective envelope, you can actually bring more material from inside the star outward. And so this is like a histogram of, you know, on, on and your left, there's the a 3D explosion on your right. There's a 1D uh, version of it. This is a paper uh, by Ben Design with Dan Casey and Mark Goldston. Um, and asks just like, where did this stuff come from? In 1D, it comes all from near the surface because there's no other channels for anything else. And in a 3D, you can know, sort of drag stuff through the, the under dense channels. Right. And it also leads to a more asymm naturally asymmetric clumpier structure for any outbursty CSM. The other thing is that if these stars are pulsating, then dust formations near some sort of Betelgeuse like dimming type event, then the convection also mediates the time scales for dissipation and settling of some of these things. So if you have you know, oscillations and then you, know, you, can, you can sort of say you know, how many convective overturn times will you get before these oscillations return to what they, their underlying normal state. All right, I don't have a ton of time. I want to mention also, actually, what I've been thinking about a lot recently is uh, more moving away from red supergiants, thinking also about yellow supergiants. So if you have a star towards the end of its life, we see type 2b supernovae. There's kind of a continuum. The more mass you lose, the less hydrogen you have to recombine that gives you a plateau. So the more you can just sort of see through it immediately. And there's this population of supernovae that are two Bs that also look like they came from yellower progenitors. And the idea there is that you have a low mass extended envelope. So now instead of being you know, 10 solar masses in your envelope, it's kind of like 0.1 solar masses on top of a nine solar mass core. This is a really interesting regime because it's very low density, but it still should be convective. Meaning, and so a lot of, you know, radiation can carry a lot of the flux, convection can carry a lot of the flux and it gets to be this messy thing. And when we do this in 1D, you basically need some engine, you know, I say stellar engineering solution, right? Here's your stars. This is work that uh, Ayana Mann, an undergraduate who worked with me last summer did. Um, and she'll be on the job market, uh, or at least the, the um, what's it called? Grad school market in the fall. So, you know, look out for her uh, applications and work. But um, one of the, so one of the things that you find is you basically strip more and more material, you get yellower and yellower, um, and you can, make sort of a relation between the total mass of hydrogen in the star and the radius of the star. But it turns out that what you assume about the density profile of that stuff, or really what you assume about your stellar engineering, I say stellar engineering, I mean like how you treat convection in 1D, how you do mixing length theory to do convection in 1D, what you do with the super adiabatic excess at the surface. Every code has a way of, you know, these stars want to blow themselves apart. Every code has a trick to stop them from doing that. Those tricks can cause sort of factor of two to 10 differences in both the recovered mass in the envelope for a given radius and 
for a given luminosity, which is tracked by the core, and also like not just the, the number of how much mass is in the envelope, but also the, the entire slope of the density profile can change. Right? So it's another, another regime that's ripe for 3D. Another reason that that matters is because then when you turn to observations, you apply various semi-analytic uh, scaling models, right? Different models with similar physics have orders of magnitude disagreements for even a similar event. So here, this is uh, one event, um, uh, 2020 bio. This is a paper by Craig Pellegrino. They fit different sort of analytic uh, models to these. And just, just look at the bottom two. These are the exact same physics with two different density profiles. You get, here's the envelope mass. You get one predicts 40, one predicts 300 uh, times 10 to the minus two. So it's basically either half a solar mass or three solar masses in the envelope. And, you know, I can't tell you if the dash or the solid line is a better fit to the regime that they're looking at. Right, and the primary, again, the primary difference is the, the density profile. So we also made some uh, yellow supergiant models in 3D, motivated by circuit envelope MESA models. These ones are really weird. They're, they're doing both pulsations and convection. So, there, you know, you see this sort of small scale convective motion that ends up kind of, you know, running in with these larger scale uh, pulsations. Uh, once they get to a steady state, they have these, you know, large scale fluctuations. They're trying even, you know, at points it looks like they're trying to do outbursts. Some of them are unsuccessful and start to fall back. Some of them are successful and manage to actually get some material that's unbound and leaves the simulation domain. And so rel relevant for the supernova problem, right, we get now a lot more clumpy material and shocks, you know, shock trains almost, you know, forming in this outer atmosphere. So this is one snapshot, one point in time. Each one of these lines is a different line of sight into the star. The dashed line here is not real. It's just an angle average of all of those. Um, Right. And here now we've taken the angle averages and just looked at different times and you get different density profiles at different times. Some of them have some stuff that's out falling, some of it's you know, in falling, some of these are in more of a sort of runaway state. Where you can also cast this in sort of a space time diagram of the you know, average velocity. So here you, these are the pulsations. Right here it tries to launch some stuff and fails. Here that stuff runs at me runs into it, and you have kind of a few of these uh, successful and unsuccessful mass ejection events. Um, the successful eruptions vary in strength, sort of about like 10 to the negative six solar masses at the rate of a couple per year. I've been working with a grad student at Harvard, uh, Shelley Chang, who did a, a, a pre-doc with us at Flatiron. Um, and she's now put together an anal a semi you know, a semi analytic type prescription for um, in a 1D model, how much energy do you expect to tap into to do an outburst? And how much mass loss would you get if you can? And we put the 3D model in this part of the HR diagram that she got, and we got actually really good agreement, which was kind of a nice, a nice result and thing to see. Um, so I think with that, I will leave up a recap, which is that observations constrain important quantities like the ejected mass and energy, Right, but the radius and early emission provide additional constraints, but they're sensitive to this outer structure. Right, cool supergiant envelopes undergo stellar radius scale convection. So if you take anything away, it's like not all stars are spheres, and some of them, even without worrying about rotation or binarity or any of this, some of them have these really rich landscapes. And then you know the yellow supergiants, we even see this convection and pulsations with these clumpy winds and failed ejections. So there's a lot of implications for supernova emission, uh, including these longer duration shock breakouts. And there's work to be done breaking these degeneracies, but I think there's also, I'm at least really excited about these upcoming UV surveys, like UVX, Ultrasat, et cetera, which are looking in this hot, you know, regime where you're actually probably, you know, probing most of the bolometric luminosity and, and we can probe this. So yeah, thank you all and uh, feel for questions. So thank you for the questions you've already asked. You probably mentioned this, but what was the main difference between the yellow supergiant and supergiant properties is just the envelope mass? The main difference is the envelope mass. There's also a difference in the radius, which is that you know if, if L goes like R squared, T to the fourth, yellow is hotter, so radius goes down. 
So the radii of yellow supergiants are more like 200 or so solar radii. So actually, yeah, yellow supergiants, I, I like to pitch them as they're, you know, they're, they're stars where their where they're, they're surface is at the Earth's orbit. All right, 215, that's the only number I know. Um, but yeah, so, and then the other primary difference is, is the mass in the envelope. And then therefore, you know, if you're lower density, radiation is you know, for the same ish opacities, radiation can carry a bit more of the energy. So some of the energy is in radiation, some of the energy is in convection. It's more subcritical. Do you see some other like and mass ejections in the We don't see clumpy winds or mass ejections in our red supergiant models. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't see them in red supergiants in nature. We don't have, like our red supergiant models aren't pulsating. And so we don't see anything that might have to do with both the pulsation and convection. Um, you know, we, we do see some evidence of something like a clumpy wind from a convection pulsation in red supergiants in nature. That's actually basically what we think Betelgeuse did when it had its great dimming of, you know, of, I guess you now four years back, but pandemic years don't count, so two years back. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I was going to say your, your red supergiants don't have recombination or dust. That's correct. Neither of none of our simulations have recombination or dust. So that's another way of kind of continuing to inflate those outer layers. Yeah. Yeah. But turbulent pressure is still the dominant form of pressure support in the outer layers. So it's unclear how much radi how much recombination will matter. I'm, I actually, I would, you know, I'd like to do it and like to see it. Um, but it does at least, you know, if you can get some stuff out to where dust would form, then dust can pick up a huge kick from these, uh, you know, from, from the, from just the really luminous star. And so that actually would be, if you can get stuff out to where dust is forming, then you should be able to get wings launched that way. Yeah. Do you have any philosophical comments on the extremely large values of alpha? Or... Yeah. So. So it's interesting. Um, depends on a lot of the regime. For a solar calibration, alpha is usually something like one point eight, and it depends also on the code that you use. For a um, in in the lossy regime. They, they found evidence that alpha can be sort of less than one. I think of alpha as more of a hand wavy number than anything particularly meaningful in that okay. sense. It's, um, I, I don't think that the mixing length is supposed to be the smallest length scale. I think that the mixing length is supposed to be a characteristic length scale over which the transport happens, at least in mixing length theory as is often conceptualized for stellar evolution codes. So some of this might even be just like a, how people conceptualize a mixing length theory for different uh, regimes. Because I don't, I, I don't think it's really the smallest length scale. I think it's more of a characteristic length scale. And this characteristic length scale for transport, that's, you know, the convective velocity is a characteristic velocity for transport, at least in mixing length theory, as it formulates this convective. So really what it's saying is actually, maybe philosophically, just that when you drag your flow, you can drag your flow for a lot longer of a of a of a length scale. And actually, that's if you look at I don't have I don't have it, but if you look at the um, or maybe I do in a backup slide, but if you look at the velocities um, and compare them to mixing length theory, the velocity profiles are actually a lot flatter in the 3D models than in the 1D, and it's because you're you know you have a well, I think, yeah, I can't find the slide, so maybe I will just leave and it. And your plumes that. are bigger than a scale height. And your plumes are bigger than a scale height. Yeah. So I have a system for the, the yellow uh, supergiant models. Did you also do like, the convection things? Do you have a sense of what the delta R is for the yellow supergiants as opposed to the red So it's a little bit difficult to say what is star and what is wind in the yellow supergiants in that but if you were to do, like, ask what's kind of the photosphere location, it's, you know, somewhere here. So now, actually, if you think of these, you know, plumes and failed winds and these things as, as creating a delta R, your delta R is almost an order, you know, R or half of R rather than 10% of R, which is, you know, but some of this is like, 
quite literally shocking. <laughs> For the for this uh, yellow super giant model, that um, are you talking about the, this mass loss, mm -hmm. episodic uh, uh, activity? That is a before uh, supernova explodes, or is it the this is what a, is the time scale here? Yeah, so these are these are evolved massive stars. We're more or less agnostic to before the supernova explodes, in part because the thermal time and 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 sound crossing times even of these envelopes are somewhat large and so we think more you know this is we need better time dependent convection simulations of the whole thing but we think that more or less the envelope is just doing this right so it's doing this if it's, it's always strict. so it's always doing this once I'm, it's I'm in that expecting region expecting to see the, the pre supernovae um, activities right from an observing point of view well there okay. there doesn't you see, you see some of this mass attachments right well you know, we have we have light curves for the there's a backup slide, but we have light curves for the yellow supergiants, and this is just sort of one of the light, you know, one of the light curves for one of our models as to what it's gonna do. And it is showing some interesting kind of well oscillatory behavior on the time scale of the pulsation, which is of order the dynamical time at the surface of the star. Um, some of these are probably related to the outburst. You take the power spectrum, you get that. But this is all you know, we haven't there's not a lot that's been looking into yellow supergiant pulsations on 20 day time scales. So I'm not certain how realistic this light curve is. Well, yeah. Yeah, Jim. Can you go to the final plot you showed of Shelley's results? You went through that really quick. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And maybe you can explain it a little more. Sure. So basically, what Shelley did was in 1D models, you can say, well, how much energy do you tap into? So there's a few. I'm not going to get into exactly what's causing the successful and failed outbursts if, if it's sort of extra radiation energy that you know gets imparted into kinetic energy of the stuff. I think that some of that is actually just, I, I still have to, I'm in the process of diagnosing exactly why these are doing what they're doing. That's one of the frustrations of the 3D work. Uh, is, I guess why it is doing what it's doing. But um, in the 1D models, basically, she, she calculates how much energy, how much excess energy you have in the regions that are locally very high opacity. So locally, the Eddington luminosity is lower. And locally, the luminosity is greater than the Eddington luminosity. So you can say, well, how much energy is there to launch some stuff? You can say, how much mass is there in that stuff? And you can say, you know, roughly assume it's kind of a dynamical time scale that this gets launched over as mediated by the circuit, you know, by the surface gravity. You can play around with that number, but that basically gets you an M dot. You can feed that back into the stellar evolution as well. Um, or you can just kind of quantify that and you can put a fudge factor and just either calibrate it or you know, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe the agreement is good because we picked the right fudge factor. Or, you know, maybe we want to calibrate our fudge factors to more of these 3D simulations as you know, we get more in different parts of the HR diagram as well. Yeah. I should say it out loud. It takes, uh, you know, an hour or a few hours to run a star in 1D on a laptop. And it takes a few months to run part of a star in 3D on a supercomputer. So. For population level statements or scaling or things, it's it's great to, to do as much in one D as you can. Yes. So there are a lot of observed uh, resolved red supergiants in nearby galaxies. Does how they're distributed as a function of color in this plot kind of constrain what the radii should be when they explode? Yeah, I'm. Yes. So I've I've been. So that depends. I want to say yes, but it does depend on what they do at the very, very end of their life. So if at the very, very end of their life, they start to inflate or they do eruptive things, then maybe there's some reason to think that they, that, that the populations have resolved red supergiants in LMC, SMC, M31, you know, all the nearby galaxies and, and, and satellites, like, 
and even the galactic ones. Um, there's a reason to think that they're representative of a population of red supergiants, but not the ones that are just about to die. Then, you know, maybe we can't do something. But I actually do think that, like, the radius distribution of them is probably a decent prior on what the progenitor radius distribution of two Ps is broadly. Um, now, that depends also on, like, which ones explode and which ones don't. There are some people who want to argue that some will, you know, that, that maybe the high mass ones will never explode alone. You know, some people want to say, oh, no, only the high mass ones explode. There's a big valley where we used to think was the peak in the, in the explosion distribution. It's like a lot of burrows is new stuff is they're exploding things that used to never explode and they're not exploding things that used to explode. So I, yeah, that's one of the reasons that I just like chop out the core and put a bomb in it and call it a day when I'm, when I'm doing these things. But yeah. I have a quick question about the slide before. Yeah, of course. Um, so this one? Uh, or... So sure that people have done a lot of time series observations of yellow supergiants. So I'm not okay. sure what to say. I know that there was a lot of work. Actually, one of the things that motivated these 3D models was that they were finding these fast yellow pulsations, like uh, Trevor Gromolinson's work and stuff, um, which may or may not, you know, there's still puzzles there. Now they're, that model is sort of dis you know, that, those observations are a little disfavored as being real rather than contamination by nearby binary or something. We don't see anything like that in our 3D models, but like most of the work on pulsating yellow supergiants so far has been devoted, at least as far as I know, to these like fast yellow pulsators, which are like seconds, minutes, day time scales, not these sort of time day pulsations. Um, so I'd be curious actually. We do predict, you know, something like a thermal pulsation. I mean, Trevor must have light curves. He has test data for these things. Yeah, I should reach out to him and just see, like, does, does he have any light curves that look like this model? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we're at the hour. So, any other Ooh. questions from here or from Zoom? If not, yeah, let's thank Jared again.